Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise this morning. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Truly, the Lord is worthy to be praised. Worthy. I'm thankful to be here. Thankful to be with you all. I'm just thankful for another day to worship. Amen. 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 Let's open up. This song simply says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. For he is worthy. Unto the Lord. For he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh! 
away from you that stuff. Amen. 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 The Bible says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Yes. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Hallelujah. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, and the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of of glory. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Amen. God, we thank you for all that you are and all that thank you have you, done in our lives. Mm -hmm. God, we bless you for this opportunity to be able to come and worship together. We thank you, God, for your word says where two or three are gathered in my name, there will I be also. So God, we thank you that we are here, we are gathered, yes. and we are gathered in your name. Yes. So God, we are yes. trusting and we are believing that your presence is here, God, that yes. your presence will be manifested and that, yes. God, yeah. we will have a good time on today. Yes, God, we are trusting you to speak. We're trusting you to move, God. We're trusting you to have your way. Yeah. Your way In Lord. Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Receive my word. 
and scenes and when all hell is breaking loose around us you are worthy doesn't matter who is in control here doesn't matter who is in a position down here we know that he sits high and looks low so we know that God is still in control Amen. 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 <clears throat> um, we've got one more song of worship, but before we go forward, I want to introduce our preacher for today. Um, as we continue our series from cross from the cross to Pentecost. Mm-hmm. Um, today, Minister Jessica Maudlin will be bringing the word today. Um, All right. It's definitely going to be an uh, interactive, I believe, experience, <laughs> but I do believe, um, and I, I got the chance to um, look at her sermon before today, and I really believe there's going to be some enlightening words brought, so Amen. I'm looking Amen. forward to that. Amen. Um, Amen. Let us pray for her, yes. Yes. pray with her, yes. and just pray that God will speak and that we will have ears and hearts to hear. Amen. 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 
it says, The Lord is my light and salvation. Who shall I fear? <clears throat> the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait for you. I will wait on you. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Who shall, who shall I be afraid? The Lord is. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Whom shall, whom shall I be afraid? I will wait. I will wait on you. I will wait on you. I will wait on you. I will trust in 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 you. Trust in you. Oh, I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. The Lord is my light and sound. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Whom shall, whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light and sound. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Whom shall, whom shall I be afraid?
today to stand in your presence, yes. to stand in the light of your glory. Yes. God, thank you for the opportunity to stand before these people and bring your word. Father God, as always, I pray that anything that is me that should not be said will fall on deaf ears and anything that is you is what remains. Yes. Um, yes. Hi, friends. Hi. <laughs> um, it is indeed an honor to, I think, any time we get to um, to stand in this place and um, share what the Lord has given us. Um, that's not something I take lightly, so um, thank you for having me. Um, I come from a pack of wild siblings, and so um, when I was a teenager, I often, I'm the oldest daughter, I have, I have well-developed sense of oldest daughter syndrome. Um, and when I was a teenager, it was not uncommon <laughs> that I was given the sisters and the other kids from the youth group and sent to be the chaperone for various things. So when I was a teenager, I took my middle sister and some of the kids from our youth group to see a band at a local church in Southern Indiana. This band um, was called Super Chick, and it was kind of like the Christian emo, the it band, right? Um, so we were standing in this big long line outside of a church, you know, kind of making our way in. They hadn't opened the doors yet. And as we stood in line, all of a sudden this man appears from nowhere, sidles up next to me and my sisters are standing in front of me. And he's like, what are y'all doing here? And <laughs> my sister, who is a whole show, um, <laughs> was like, oh my gosh, you don't know? Super Chick is playing tonight. How could you not know? And so this guy is just very chill, like, oh, really? Like, can you tell me, can you sing any of their songs for me? Do you know any of the lyrics? How long have you been a fan? All of this stuff. Um, I'm going to kill myself with that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so anyway, sister goes on and on and on. And at this point, like the big sister, like protective thing in me is like, what is this weirdo doing? What? Like, there's something not right here. So we finally make our way inside the building. My sister's like, we've got these tickets. We're going to be right in the front row. Are you going to come stand with us? And this guy's like, oh ah, I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll see you in a little bit. Oh, wow. um, and he winks at me and disappears. And I'm like, what in the world just happened? That is very strange. So some of you may be a little quicker than we were at 17 and 14. <laughs> and we did indeed see this man again as he comes on stage uh -huh. as the bass player <laughs> for this band. <laughs> Um, the look of shock on my sister's face um, was as she pieced together what had happened because he saw us and pointed at us um, as they started playing. Mm -hmm. And the only thing, yeah, the only thing better than the look of shock on her face was just the total joy on his face as he gets to like, you know. So for months afterwards, um, she just couldn't believe that she had spent this significant amount of time talking to this man basically about himself. Um, and he didn't let on at all until the time was right for her eyes to be open. Yeah. Um, so this story maybe sets you up for where we're going today. Um, so we're going to be in Luke 24. Um, in the lead up to this, we have heard part of the story over the last few weeks. The women have gone to the tomb. They've seen the angels who told them, that Christ is no longer in the tomb, but he's risen. The women go back and tell the 11 disciples and the other people that are gathered there that he's he's not there, he's risen. The men didn't believe them. Well, 
<laughs> because, quote, it seemed like nonsense to them. Well, mm -hmm. do better, my guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So Peter takes off running, finds the grave clothes there, and then goes away, confused and wondering what has happened. Mm -hmm. We've been there, right? Mm -hmm. I thought we knew what was happening now. So this is where we are in verse 13. This is what has happened. And this is quite a bit of text, but I think you need it all, so bear with me. Right. In verse 13, now that same day, so the same day all of these things have happened, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus asked, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Mm -hmm. One of them, Cleopas, Cleo Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asks. Oh, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Mm -hmm. And what is more, it's now the third day since all of this has taken place. And in addition, some of our women have amazed us. Now they're amazing before they were nonsense. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came to us and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus spoke to them and said, how foolish you are mm -hmm. and how slow to believe all of what the prophets have well, spoken. Yeah, yeah. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. I can see that, you know, like, peace out, homie. Like, if I had been those people, like, go ahead, go on with you. But the, the two urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. Mm -hmm. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared. <laughs> they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while they talked with us on the road and opened the scripture, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Yes. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, saying, It's true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Um, this text is one that in my mind, when I was thinking about preaching on this, I was like, oh, this is super familiar. Like this is, I've got this, I know what this is. Mm -hmm. But as I, I've sat with it the last few weeks, um, I started asking some questions and it's really become illuminated in some new ways mm -hmm. for me. Um, to start with, I wanted to know why Emmaus. Listen. Why is this important? Teach Jesse. So in my mind, I thought the road part of the Emmaus story was significant because the revelation takes place on the way there. But the revelation doesn't take place. The revelation of Christ doesn't take place on the road. Mm. It's after they've walked the road. Mm. So, yeah. why, so why does Luke specify the name of the town? Um, when I you know, was doing some different reading and people who are tour guides in Palestine and Israel can't even agree if this place exists anymore. Mm. Come on. Say so that. it's not that this place is significant. Mm -hmm. They think it's west of Jerusalem, Teach. about seven miles, because that's what the text says. But when you look at the geography of that, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really seem to matter which town it is. So why is it referenced specifically? Mm -hmm. Come on. So I dug into that and I stumbled upon um, some writings from a book that was published in 2001 by a guy named William Weir. And the book is 50 Battles That Changed the World. And 
He says that in New Testament times, Emmaus is a place would have meant something to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. They would have connected it to a place, um, they would have connected it to the Battle of Emmaus. The Battle of Emmaus was fought a century and a half before this, this walk would have occurred and um, would have been fought by Judas Maccabee and his troops. That victory meant the end of one of the worst holocausts that the Jewish people in, in Jewish history. And it meant the independence of Judah mm -hmm. for the first time since the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem. Wow. So this is a place of freedom. Yeah. Mm. After this battle at Emmaus, Judas Maccabee successfully engaged various other nations and secured a monumental task of a long-lasting peace in Palestine. So in this book, Weir goes on to rank the Battle of Emmaus as um, the 20th most influential battle in the, in the history of mankind. That victory ensured that Judaism didn't die, mm. and because it didn't die, Christianity could be born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the place that they're headed has some pretty weighty significance that maybe isn't immediately obvious to us. So given that, I'm like, okay, so who are, who are these two disciples then? Mm -hmm. Because I think in my mind, I always thought that these two that were on the road were part of that OG 11 crew, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the text doesn't actually say that when you look at it. It says two of them, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it does, Luke does tell us that one of them is this Cleopas, who is also known as Clopas and sometimes Alpheus, which, yay, lots of names. <laughs> Makes things really easy. So, but in John 19.25, there is a Cleopas and a disciple named Mary, who also happens to be his wife, mm -hmm. present at the cross during the crucifixion. So many Bible scholars, and this was the first time that I'd ever seen this, believe that the two were actually not two men, but Cleopas and Mary mm -hmm. headed back to Emmaus. Uh -huh. um, so part of these, so this couple, Cleopas and Mary, part of this intimate circle who had been faithful followers of the Lord, even to his death, were the very two who were now walking back to their home in mm -hmm. Emmaus, mm -hmm. which is this place of freedom mm -hmm. later that day after all of this has happened. And for me, that kind of painted a different picture. Mm -hmm. I think I saw in a new light the intimacy of this conversation that they must have been having. The honesty that they were probably sharing, the stuff that you say to your to your close person that you maybe don't say to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of just stumbling along, no doubt exhausted, having processed this trauma that they witnessed, not only this violent death of their friend, but of this promised Messiah. Mm -hmm. And also... I would have to imagine of their very hope. Mm. So heavy of heart and grieving their master, confused, I imagine, about the women's accounts, about is the promise going to be fulfilled? They're headed home. And along comes this guy. <laughs> Just sort of out of your hair. <laughs> right. <laughs> Kind of like the bass player from earlier. <laughs> they don't see him as Jesus. He's just a guy. Yeah. He's just a guy that shows up. And he seems to be absolutely clueless. <laughs> so much so that his seeming ignorance, Luke tells us, stops them in their tracks. Yeah. Can you imagine how frustrated Cleopas and Mary must have been? You've got to be the only doofus in this whole dang country that doesn't know what's happening. I understand what's going on. Right? Like, I, just, ugh, right? And yet, these two chose a different response. Mm -hmm. um, they're just trying to get home so they can figure out what's next. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to process their shattered hopes and their dreams for this Jesus, this prophet, this Messiah, who through his great and mighty works were going was going to redeem Israel. Mm -hmm. Their concept of redemption meant that conquering, that a conquering all-powerful Messiah would come and lead them to freedom. Yeah. But their idea of redemption had been decimated by the death mm -hmm. of Christ, by what they saw as the death of what had long been promised to them. And so after they've poured out their hearts, and you can tell what they, you know, this heaviness that they've been through, What's Jesus' response? Mm. 
you would think the Christian thing to do would be to comfort them, mm. to reassure them, mm. to give them the ta-da, uh, guess what, uh, I'm here, and to speak specific comfort to them. But he doesn't. And I think sometimes we have to sit in our disappointment, even in the present. Well, story, yes. right? come on. Yeah. Yeah. For the story to unfold. Yeah. So not only does he not, ta-da, <laughs> be called some names. How foolish you are. Right. Come on. How foolish you are, Jesus tells these two disciples. Something to note here that I think is interesting for Jewish culture, the term fool or to call someone foolish doesn't actually uh, refer to um, somebody of low intelligence. Uh -huh. Fool in this context isn't an intellectual assessment. It's a moral yes, one. Mm -hmm. um, so to be called a fool by God is to come under his judgment because I think maybe this was, I don't know if it was in the bulletin or if Terrell said it this morning, but to be called a fool by God is to come under his judgment because it's the fool who says in his heart there is no God. Mm -hmm. um, and Christ in his love could not walk away from these disciples, leaving them under judgment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in kind of the ultimate, let me tell you something you don't know, mm. <laughs> Jesus, who is still a stranger, proceeds to walk with Cleopas and Mary on the road, but he also walks them through scripture. Mm -hmm. Luke doesn't like tell us that. specifically <clears throat> which text he's, that Jesus starts with, but given that he's tracing how the promise is going to be filled, I could imagine that he starts somewhere early with text, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe oh, where right. the seed of the woman would crush the heel, the head of the, oh, sorry, the head of the serpent while the seed of the serpent would bruise his heel. Mm -hmm. Next, maybe he covers the covenant with Noah and the covenant with Abraham. Maybe he talks about how in Genesis 15, Abraham believed in God and it was counted to Abraham as righteousness. Mm -hmm. Where did that righteousness come from? It didn't come from Abraham himself, mm -hmm. but it came from the one who would come and fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. 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 God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his only son, the one whom he loved. Mm -hmm. And Abraham looked at that son, and I can imagine crossing his fingers when Isaac asks, where's our sacrifice? Mm -hmm. He says, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Yeah, yeah. And just as Abraham is ready to plunge his blade into his son, a voice comes from heaven, and Abraham turns, and there indeed was the ram. Yes. The substitute was given. Yeah. The ram was slain on Mount Moriah, which is the location that 2,000 years later was named Golgotha, mm -hmm. where God took his son, mm -hmm. his only son, mm -hmm. whom he loved, and offered him on the cross, and no one was there. Mm -hmm. to say stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe Jesus continued them to tell them about Jacob and his son Joseph and the migration to Egypt and the enslavement of God's people and the appearance of God in a burning bush to Moses saying, Moses, take off your shoes. Holy You're ground. on the holy ground. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have heard the cries of my people and I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And so Moses went Perhaps next, Jesus talks about the construction of the tabernacle, mm. which was the symbolic description of the person and work of Jesus, mm. who later was the living tabernacle, mm -hmm. who became incarnate and dwelled among mm -hmm. us. Jesus yeah. took this couple through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through Daniel, through Ezekiel, and yeah, the yeah. valley of Jessica dry bones, Micah's prophecy about a village that would be the exact location where the Messiah would be born. So from Genesis to Malachi, mm -hmm. Jesus speaks the scriptures mm -hmm. while walking to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus tells them, all of these things happened by necessity. It was not an accident that Judas betrayed Jesus that night. Mm -hmm. It was not an accident the leaders conspired to destroy him. God prepared 2,000 years of mm. prophecy yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that they would know, so that we would know, mm -hmm. that the fulfillment of the promised Messiah would be accomplished not only through the Messiah's life, but through the death and resurrection. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
back in the text when I put the emphasis on we have believed. Mm -hmm. It's not just in his life that the Messiah comes. Mm -hmm. It's in the death and resurrection. And these things were ordained from the foundation of the world. Yes. They had to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Emmaus story, when we look at the text, I think it is a revelation story, but I think there are these three specific kind of ways in which Jesus opens things to these two disciples, right? So the first one is he opens the scriptures to them as they walk in their disappointment and grief. The word of God is always the first witness of the reality of God. Secondly, Jesus opens their eyes. This mm. second opening, I think, is a consequence of the first. Mm. Jesus had taught them on the way so that they would be prepared. Yeah. And this is actually another place that I had misremembered the story i think like i said earlier uh, for some reason in my mind the main revelation happened on the road but he isn't he's it's revealed to him later as he sat with them and broke bread oh, in their yes. homes mm -hmm. luke writes that their eyes were opened and they recognized him so this for me then uh having misremembered this why at the table why did this happen at the table? I don't believe <laughs> that Jesus chose to reveal himself at the dinner table is coincidental. Mm -hmm. There's something when at its best, um, relaxing at a table. Yes. About the fellowship of a table. Yes. Where yes, people they, are they're gathered, mm -hmm. there's joy, they're there to fill their bellies, they're there mm -hmm. to rest, they're there to be nourished. Intimacy and friendship develops, relationships are strengthened. At its best, <laughs> the table is amazing. Yes. Luke's description of what Jesus does with this bread. He takes it, he blesses it, he, broke, he breaks it, he gives it. That's the same action that's used in the gospel that mm -hmm. talks about the miraculous feeding of the mm -hmm. 5,000. Mm -hmm. And it's also obviously what we see at the Last Supper. Um, Cleopas and Mary finally recognize Jesus because he's present in the, that breaking of the bread, even as he is present with us still when we participate in communion or Eucharist, whatever you call it. And the text says that with that breaking of the bread, their hearts burned, yes. been burned within them, or they recognized that their hearts had been burning within them. Why was the, break, the breaking of the bread, why did that cause their eyes to be open? It wasn't something magical about the bread, no, no, no. if you were wondering. <laughs> um, it wasn't just because he had invited himself to walk along with them, which is something I think is interesting, that um, he just appeared and then he kept walking, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, um, But it happened because these two, like I said earlier, they chose to react differently than some of us might have in our grief and processing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They extended this radical hospitality to a stranger. If they had not done that, if they had not invited Jesus to their table, if they had not been willing to take the time to eat with him, to invite him in, if they had just let him continue on his way, as the text said that he was aiming to do, there would have been no breaking and no recognition of the sacred before them. Um, if you really want to go down a rabbit hole, and I didn't because it doesn't really take too much time, but as I looked at what was the cultural significance of this breaking of the bread wow. because the reason that, that happened at the Last Supper was because that was part of Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. right? Jesus didn't randomly like look like the bread break apart, right? <laughs> so there, there is culture and things about that. And one of the things that I think is important to note here is that the host of a home is the one to break the bread. Yeah, mm -hmm. a guest would not be in the home yeah. and take the bread and break it. And yet Christ does this and blesses it without invitation. Mm -hmm. And some Torah scholars really go into this, you know, great analysis about how that's symbolic about the authority that Christ now has, mm -hmm. even above culture, tradition, scripture, mm -hmm. and, and that Christ is embodying mm -hmm. that and embracing it and not waiting for the invitation mm -hmm. to take the bread and break mm -hmm. it. So that's a rabbit hole you can go down sometime if you'd like. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but so without this, they would have remained clueless. They would have remained depressed. They would have remained blind. But by inviting the stranger into their community, by the community, the acts of breaking bread together, their own eyes were open to what was sacred and to what it means to walk with Jesus. But then 
But then there's more. There's more. Yeah. <laughs> so right when they finally do recognize him in the breaking of the bread, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening here? Um, right, we feel like that in life sometimes, right? Yes. So sure. much. <laughs> in verse twenty nine, he though he had told them he would stay with them, and although he could no longer see them, he is still present in the bread that he blessed mm. and broke and gave to them. I believe that this is one of the ways that Christ fulfills the promise from Matthew 28, 20 about um, Christ remaining with us to the end of the age. It's one of the, one of the ways. Um, I think that's part of what the power of, of communion is. Yes. Um, so at the very end of the story, Cleopas and Mary, who have come from Jerusalem, walked to Emmaus, had this whole emotional thing, have kind of had their minds blown by this spiritual revelation, they're like, and it's nighttime now, right? They didn't want Jesus to go on because it was evening. They're like, oh, we got to go back. Got to go back. So get back on the road. Go back to Jerusalem to share what had happening, yes. what had happened, what they, what had been revealed to them. And this is where the last of those, I said there were like three, three ways in which um, Luke shows the openings uh, that happened in this story to people. So he writes that as they were sharing what had happened is they were speaking about the truth and revelation of Christ. Christ appears in the midst of all of these other people and he opens their understanding. So I think sometimes scripture can be open to us intellectually, yes. but something else ha has yes. to happen here, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. So he opens their understanding. They can understand the scripture that he has shared with them. The opening of their minds is what enables us to understand the depth and the breadth of the salvation story. And it qualifies us to share that with other people. Mm -hmm. It's that process of opening. Um, as I am coming to the end of this, um, something else that I think is really interesting because we see this a lot um, when we look at, you know, just like Christ was doing, walking, walking the disciples through the Old Testament, the encounter on the road to Emmaus and in Emmaus is in some ways, a reversal of the Garden of Eden story mm -hmm. in which God walked with Adam and Eve. Their eyes were open to sin because they ate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now God incarnate in Christ walks mm -hmm. with another couple mm -hmm. whose eyes are open to Jesus and the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jesus is the, the tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life. So um, God, Jesus blesses them by breaking open the scripture and breaking open mm -hmm. the bread. And it reverses yeah. the Garden of Eden yeah. story, yes. right? Yeah. So these two disciples in this Emmaus Road story is a physical representation of the history of salvation. Mm -hmm. Walking away from God in our own despair and sin and partial understanding mm -hmm. and returning to God yeah. through this whole person yeah. of Jesus Christ Whoa. who is present with us always and still. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of the things about me is that sometimes I don't know how to land a plane. Um, so um, there have been a few sermons at Grace where it ended with the end. Right. And then I walked away. But, um, so, but I'm learning and I'm growing. And so one of the things I think is really important, I'm, I think I'm, my style is much more teaching than preaching, but, um, you know, when we come into the house of God and we are filled and then we go away empty, mm. it doesn't matter. Right, it doesn't matter what we've heard, and so I, Terrell, referenced my interactive uh, experience. But one of the things I like to do, right, is how do we take this away from here? How do we take it with us? How do we respond to whatever, whether it's something I've shared or something that the Holy Spirit has spoken to through something I've said? Um, and so for today, um, Pastor Crossland asked when I came in, I'm nosy about this bread, so um, <laughs> I brought bread because not for communion but so that we could have something to have the reminder of the, oh, yes. what happens in the taking and the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you want more than one, because maybe you want to share it with someone else, um, I think that there's enough for that. But I wanted to close with this blessing to go along with the bread that is from a writer named Jane Richardson, if you're familiar with any of her work. Um, but I think it is a good reminder for us and it's, let us bless the bread that gives itself to us <coughs> with its terrible weight and its infinite grace. Mm. 
Let us bless this poured out for us with a love that makes us anew. Let us gather around this gift simply given and deeply blessed. And then let us go bearing the bread, laying the table yes. to a hungry world. So I brought the bread so you can take it. And if you eat it at some point this week, that you can remember the blessing that comes with breaking the mm-hmm. bread. Or maybe there's somebody in your life that maybe they need a reminder of that and you can share it with them. Um, it is not gluten free, and for that I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> here we go. Here we go. <laughs> gluten is tasty. Um, so I may be going to hand it back over. Praise the Lord. Unless you want me to say it. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 It's funny how you can look at a scripture that you have read over and over and over and over and over and, over and miss something that that seemingly simple. Um, but I'm thankful that God's word is alive. Yes. His word doesn't change, but the way we understand it continues to evolve. And I'm thankful. Um, so, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Lord, for the word that we have received. Um, I think that's it. I think that's it. The end, right? Um, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Try not to crash and burn is what I is what I think. Um, we thank everybody that's joined us. Um, I don't think I do it enough. Thank everyone that joins us online. Um, those on Facebook, those on YouTube. Yeah. Um, thank you for joining us for worship via live stream. Um, there are several ways to connect. Uh, remember Tuesday mornings, prayer call with Grace, and then on Wednesday, that's at 7.30 a.m., and then on Wednesdays, Bible study uh, slash prayer meeting, prayer call on Wednesdays at 705. My dad with the fires. Amen. 705. Um, and then definitely back here again on Sunday morning at 1035. Um, please remember to uh, send your tithes and your offerings. Bring them. What are we? 132 South 41st Street. We are here. And we are live. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let us stand. <clears throat> Let us pray. God, again, we thank you. Thank you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the preacher. We ask God that you would pour back into her um, double portion of what she has poured out to us. And I pray that you settle her spirit and she would know that you are pleased. God, I pray now that you would Help us to leave from this place as they did with their hearts burning. Mm. Help us to leave out of here today oh, yes. uh, with a mind and a heart to tell somebody, somebody. about this Jesus that Jesus. we encountered yes. and that we encounter on a daily basis. Yes. God, we bless you. We praise you. Be with us as we leave this place. Please come. Go in peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, Mary. Amen. Come on, Mary. <laughs> Now, <laughs> 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 <laughs>